Welcome to our backyard. This is the Backyard Philosophy Podcast. We are two friends having a discussion after everyone else has passed out or gone to bed. Grab a drink and listen as we discuss everything from automation, space exploration, and why the meaning of life is 42. You ever feel like there's a whole wide world out there just waiting to be explored and knowledge to be gained? Then you start researching, digging a little deeper and exploring, and then you realize that you are way dumber than you previously thought. Yeah, that's me this episode. Even more as I try to understand and even attempt to teach about other states of matter. That's right, folks. States of matter. And it's not the matter that you were taught in school. The matter that you, your teachers, and your parents all learned and talked about, they all lied to you. But before that, Nick, how are you doing? What are you drinking? Doing great. Ready to be confused. Drinking Coors Light. Joke's on you. I always live in a state of constant confusion. I'm joining you with some vodka and lemonade, and I gotta tell you, it's very dangerous. I don't taste anything but the lemonade. You may just have COVID. <laughs> But before we begin this episode, there is a part one to this episode. You don't have to listen to it. They each stand alone. But if you want to learn more about States of Matter, I recommend go checking that out. Now, for those interested in how the universe works, what makes things real, boy, I got some interesting stuff for you this episode. So, just a little synopsis. There are way more than four states of matter in the universe. Dozens or more. Some argue for up to 18 to 30 different states of matter. And I know a few of them. I tried to explain a few of them. And the ones I'm covering this episode, boy, did I go down a rabbit hole. And Nick, I have to tell you, I got my fluffy white tail dirty going down this rabbit hole. So let us begin with states of matter that was in the beginning of the universe and perhaps still exist, or at least can be still made in the lab. Quark gluon plasma. Is that one state of matter or are you saying all of them? Quark Gluon plasma is one state of matter. It's also known as QGP. And this is the building blocks of most other matter. Sort of. In the very beginning of the universe, and I'm talking millionths of a second of into this thing we call the universe, this matter, quark gluon plasma, for lack of better words, began. Now, quarks may sound familiar to some of you because it's used a lot in quantum physics, and you listen to a previous episode. It's also used a lot in like Hollywood movies talking about quarks. Quarks are what you have when you break down or how the universe formed protons and neutrons. Gluon is what, from what I can tell, a type of particle that helps exchange forces between quarks. Think gluon glue, kind of a binding particle between quarks. I was able to infer that once. <laughs> Well, it gets more complicated as we go on. So gluon is not normal glue. It's its own particle. So we have quark gluon. What about plasma? Well, this isn't charged plasma. Most of us were taught in science class. This is color charged plasma. And despite its name, has nothing to do with color. But luckily, people far, far smarter than me has made an analogy using colors to explain what color charges are. I find that a bit ironic and a bit hilarious, but, you know, c'est la vie. So, Nick, I want you to imagine three circles, one of them being red, one of them being blue, and one of them being green. Those are the quark charges in a quark gluon plasma. Much like like a proton and electron have a charge, so do quarks, but instead of two charges, they have three charges. Now, imagine another set of three circles, cyan, magenta, and yellow. Those are anti-quarks. Whoa, 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 anti-quarks. Where do those come in? Well, equal and opposite, ladies and gentlemen. Anything Isaac Newton has taught us is you can't have one without the other. You can't have matter without antimatter. You can't have quarks without anti-quarks. Nature always has a balance. Can't have binge drinking without hangovers. (laughs) Now, if you start overlapping these colors, like the blue and red to get purple or the yellow and red to get orange, these colors made by mixing other colors, so those particles made by mixing those other particles, by the same particles, gets you the particle gluon. And this somehow soup of a plasma 
made of gluon and quarks are bonded together until they cool. And once they start cooling, they turn into protons and neutrons, hence why it's only been done in laboratory and the very beginning of the universe. So the only way we can even observe or see quark gluon plasma is in particle accelerators. Well, that's good because I was just about to ask what is what is being applied to those to heat them up. So thanks for that. <laughs> Speed. Speed makes everything hot. But this will be a common theme for all these quarky. Huh, get it, Nick? Quarky? Quarks? Yep. Huh. No, still not a fan of puns. <laughs> but they are quite a common theme for these states of matter today. They will need to usually have an extreme environment, like a hydron temperature extreme to live in, and or simply just not found naturally in the universe. They have to be laboratory made. And for those maybe not knowing what a hydron temperature is, because I didn't until researching this, it's a theoretical temperature in which ordinary matter is no longer stable. Hydronic is simply another word for ordinary matter, fancy name, simple idea. So hydronic temperature, I'm sorry, hydron temperature is just when things get so hot, matter is no longer stable, which is a scary, scary thought. So, and this is the, the dumb question here. This has nothing to do with water. What? You're saying the word hydro a lot. Hydro, all right. H-A-G-E-D-R-D-O-R-N. No, oh, well, that is not pronounced how it's spelled. But so that, now I'm, I'm the idiot. I'll be honest. It might not be pronounced that way. I tried my best. I had a hard time finding it spoken. That's true. Your pronunciations are... They are legendary. ...to be desired. But good good to know how it is spelled. <laughs> I appreciate that. I'd probably pronounce it the same way, so I can't give you too much shit. Nah, you can go right ahead. But sticking with color, not actually meaning color, which is confusing as all hell, brings us to our next state of matter, color glass condensate. This is a theoretical state of matter in which a nuclei of an atom is traveling near the speed of light. And as a result, the gluons that bind the atom together become more dense, like neutron sun dent. For those who don't know, the faster you go closer to the speed of light, the more dense you get, which is weird to think about because photons don't have mass and they're traveling at the speed of light. But if an object starts traveling near the speed of light, it becomes pretty much infinitely dense. Anyhow, I confess, this special state of matter, this color glass condensate, acts somewhat, from what I could tell, similar to glass. Hence where it kind of gets its glass in its name in a short period of time it's a solid in a long period of time it's a liquid but on a quantum level and traveling near the speed of light and like the dense of a dying star yeah it's kind of kind of over my head but i think i came up with an example nick that you might enjoy this is an example that okay might explain it it's not exactly how this state of matter works but i but i think you'll get the point across nick i want you to imagine half a bottle of honey you got that in your mind yep you tie a rope to it and you start spinning in a circle around your head as fast as you can go the honey which is a liquid will all be pushed to the bottom of the bottle and the faster you spin it the more compacted it gets kind of like the faster you get to the speed of light the denser you get then as you are spinning the bottle you watch it in a moment's glance, it would look like the honey is solid. But soon, it, over time, when you start getting tired and your arms start to waver and you're not spinning as fast as you can, you would see the honey move more like waves. You would see the honey more act like a liquid. That's because it's a liquid over long periods of time. This is similar to colored glass condensate. It's not like it's not exactly like that, but I think it's a good analogy, and I. Hope it clarifies it a little bit. Does it, Nick? Yes, I understand the honey analogy. So far, I explained it, and so far, you're not asleep yet, so I'm going to chalk this up to success. Now, going back again a little bit to a different state of matter called the Rydberg Polarian State of Matter, P-O-L-A-R-O-N. This is a state of matter that we can make, well, maybe not you and I, Nick, but 
smarter people than us <laughs> have made this matter using lasers and are able to take ultra cold stromium atoms i believe it was also done with virginium i might be mistaken with that and using lasers and ultra cold stromium they're able to make that structure of those atoms into something so complex has such a complex structure that has never been seen before in nature and this state of matter i think strong i understood what they were talking about but i don't think i comprehend it let's break down the rydberg polaron rydberg rydberg is when a atom has one or more electrons that have energy a very very precise amount of energy simply just so the or the orbit of the electrons are as far as away from the nucleus as possible without breaking away from the nucleus not too much not too little so those might remember in science class with an atom with protons and neutrons in the center electrons going around imagine an electron at the very very edge just wanting to break free and fly off but just not quite enough this ladies and gentlemen, is the Ryberg. This is the state. It's when electrons have such a precise energy that they're balancing on the edge of their, balancing on the edge of the border. And like most funky physics stuff, Ryberg atoms love the cold, the freezing, near absolute zero cold. That's near absolute Kelvin, not Celsius, ladies and gentlemen. Now the other word in the Ryberg polaron state of matter, polarons. This is a quasi-particle not quite a particle and not quite its own thing think similar to light it's not like light but it's a good analogy nonetheless to explain what a quasi particle is light behaves both like a particle and a wave polarons are similar and in between both and neither a quasi particle but polarons are when a single particle interacts strongly enough with its environment to cause other nearby matter to rearrange themselves so analogy for this again these are just analogies to help explain it imagine a strong enough magnet to start pulling things near it to affect it but instead of it being a magnet attracting iron or some other ferric material it would be rearranging the atoms itself in that solid in that iron that's kind of what a polaron is so when you start to mix those two together rydberg which is an electron at very far edge of its orbit polaron which changes states of matter around itself that's how you get the state of matter called rybar polaron which i think i understand i have no idea how it works but i get the concept what about you nick okay so yeah, no, I'm, uh, I'm, I understand everything you said. I'm just trying to put it together. It's not that any of the words confuse me. I'm just, uh, just kind of confused, I guess. So yes, I, I, I'm confused. Sounds like we're in the same boat. The best way I can imagine it is it's not like this, but imagine an atom, right? You have your protons, your neutrons, and your electrons. Now say the electron gets energized so it jumps up a valence electron point to the very edge so it's the farthest it can be from the nucleus but any more energy would cause the electrons to fly away so you could have like ions and uh, negatively charged and positively charged protons but it's right at that border all right it's like you're standing on a diving board the water is free space the ladder is protons and neutrons and you're an electron standing at the very, very edge on your tippy toes uh, on the diving board. Now, standing at the edge of the diving board, you're able to interact with your environment, Nick. You're a human being. You could catch a football. You could throw a football. You could change the matter around you. And when you combine these two things, you at the very, very edge of the connection between a neutron and electron, and being able to change your environment around you that is what from my understand is a riber polaron but it's not electrons and neutrons and protons they're particles a quasi particle being uh, being electron but also quarks are you a little bit more clarified 
I would say I have a better understanding, but I wouldn't say I completely understand. Perfect. Sticking with matter that I'm foolish enough to believe that I have some grasp on, let's drop out Dropleton. D-R-O-P-L-E-T-O-N. Dropleton. It, it sounds like a, like a generic drug. It does, doesn't it? Like you take Sudafed and take Dropleton right before yeah, going exactly. to bed. Yeah, exactly. Which this state of matter, funny enough, was discovered accidentally. Dropleton, like the Rydberg Polaron, is another quasi-particle, but rather than acting with particle behavior, it acts with liquid behavior. It acts much like a super solid, where it acts both as a fluid and a solid, but on a quantum scale. This liquid behavior that a Dropleton has is kind of how Dropleton got its name, you know, liquid drop so a great image of it because droplington funny enough is a big enough quantum effect that can be seen with a microscope like with a good enough microscope you can see it with the human eye you don't have to use computers simulations mathematics you can physically see it and to describe the shape of a droplington imagine when it rains on a lake and drops of water create ripples and bounce a little bit you know when a water when a water drop hits a lake and kind of pops back up that's what kind of a dropleton looks like. And I, you know, if it looks kind of like a water drop and it kind of acts like a fluid, how could you not aim it something water related? And this happened, I think, in 2013 was the dropleton first discovered, which is very cool about this particle is this is the first ever quasi particle ever to have liquid behavior. That's why it gets its own state of matter. And I believe dropleton was discovered in 2013. So it's a very newish state of matter and if this is the first liquid behavior quasi particle i imagine there has to be more so i imagine the states of matter over time are just going to increase now these next states of matter are all very similar just the particle that it focuses on changes but because they're all so similar i'm going to explain them all at once this might sound like a daunting task and it's probably dumb for me to do i'm probably gonna get some stuff wrong but let's talk about degenerate matter no nick it's not a litter not i was thinking more just like the kind of degenerate that wears pit vipers but continue degenerate matter can be broken down into electron neutron proton and quark degenerate matter and this is when really dense particles called ferromic matter sometimes referred to as fermon and all a fermon is it's a particle following a set of rules called the fermi Dirac statistics, which is a bunch of fancy words for quantum particle statistics, which did not know that was a thing, and apparently they have their own rules. So degenerate matter is when dense particles, like the electrons, neutrons, protons, and quarks just mentioned earlier, follow those set of rules, the Fermi Dirac statistics rules. Is the first rule of the Fermi diuretic statistic rule don't talk about the fermi diuretic statistic tool <laughs> say that 10 times fast i double dare you i'm good but no nick <laughs> no nick it's not to not discuss it i was kind of hoping it was to not discuss it god damn it you you will love <laughs> physics you will learn about physics so when this matter and particles are following these rules and have high pressure specifically gravitational pressure so white dwarfs neutron stars that kind of thing and when gravitational pressure acts on fermin particles you get degenerate matter a quantum particle that occupies the same quantum state that it's tied to which from what i understand is like a domino effect with quantum entanglement so the gravitational waves change these particles to act kind of in unison with other tied particles that is the closest i got to understanding it and i i have no other idea besides that <laughs> sticking with the fermic diaric that brings us to fermic condensate similar to bose einstein condensate which i covered in another mini episode which you go to check out at backyard philosophy fermic condensate is a super fluid phase of fermionic particles so a bunch of particles following a set of rules, but this time, similar to the degenerate matter, 
Instead of pressure, this time it's temperature. Frigid cold temperature, again, going near absolute zero. And when you mix fermic particles with the cold, you get a super fluid-ish state of matter that has attributes of both a gas and a liquid. And another cool thing about, <laughs> get it, cool thing, super cooling. <laughs> Another, Nick, physics has lots of puns, I just realized. And now we get to the root of why I don't like physics. First off is gravity, but second, definitely puns. <laughs> don't worry. I'll win you back in the end. Just watch me. But another cool thing about pheromonic condensate is the lack of definite shape. In other words, it's a bunch of quantum particles that are cold that don't have a shape. Yeah, that's a... Uh... That's a weird one to think about, a 3D object not having a defined shape. That's, uh, that's a hard one for me to wrap my brain around. Following the Fermon trend, heavy Fermon materials. And I honestly don't know if this is a state of matter. I just saw it a lot coming up when researching different states of matter. I believe it to be like Fermat kind of state, but rather acting like a superfluid which is acting like a liquid or gas. Heavy Fermon acts more like a solid, but I'm not completely sure, to be honest with you. Nick, how about I try to convince you that physics is awesome and I can win you back right here, right now, with this state of matter. Okay, I'm I'm pretty, pretty, uh, let's just say I don't believe you, but, but go on. Nick, this state of matter might make lightsabers from Star Wars possible. You son of a bitch, I'm in. <laughs> yes! To finish it out, perhaps the weirdest state of matter, or at least to me, once again is a, another theoretical state of matter, but in the wild might actually exist. It might exist in a galaxy far, 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 far away, away, but also somehow in the past. Yeah. I mean, both those statements could be true. Now, this is a state of matter that we sort of made in the lab, but again, this might happen in the wild which is really weird with all these super states of matter. All right. I I know what you meant, but all I heard was this might happen in the wild, and I just had a picture of a mountain lion with a lightsaber, and I don't know if I'm ready for that. <laughs> a general, <laughs> general grievous mountain lion? Now, you, your term for might happen in the wild and mine for might happen in the wild might be a little different, so... <laughs> <laughs> oh well dorothy we're not in kansas anymore <laughs> we're on tatooine this mo this state of matter photomic molecule state of matter and just on an overview destroys my brain on so many levels photomic molecules is when photons that's being light are bounded together to form a molecule just like protons bonding with neutrons it'd be photons with other photons it is binding light together with other light. And that hurts so much in my brain. Like I mentioned earlier, photons are massless, but it's really weird. When you bond photons together, like in photonic molecule state of matter, they interact so strongly that the photons behave as if they have mass, which confuses me to all hell. When you have two massless objects put together they act like they have mass. It's like getting one plus one and getting a hundred. Not quite sure how that math works, but again, Nick, I think this might be your favorite state of matter. The reason why, like I mentioned with lightsabers, is scientists themselves have drawn analogies between phenonic molecules and Star Wars lightsabers. Because if you shine a light at another piece of light, like a flashlight shining at a flashlight, the light just goes through each other because they don't interact. But when you turn photomic molecules against photomic molecules, they act like uh, two bouncing, like a, like a ball bouncing off a wall. They bounce off each other. So with binding light that doesn't interact with other light together, they interact with other, other photomic molecules that were binded together. So you could have two pieces of light hit each other like a solid, hence having lightsabers. And that's the dream. Like, that is the dream. That's Everyone always says that's the dream. I always say that's the dream. But man, if I could have a lightsaber, not only would that be awesome, but let's talk about how to revolutionize the logging industry. No more wasteful chains. 
We just have lightsabers to cut down trees. That's the dream. Again, I said it. It's the same dream, though. How dare you bring trees into the physics world? All right, we can cut that one out. That was uncalled for, and I apologize. <laughs> no, but shout out to the University of Melbourne for helping me with the explanation. They broke it down kind of nice for my simple brain to understand. So, again, this hurts my brain on so many levels that light interacting with other light creates something that has mass from two things that doesn't have mass and interacts with those things but not anything i it's people i don't think you understand how weird this is and i i don't think i understand how weird this is but that brings it to the conclusion of different states of matter of all the ones that are currently known and hopefully there are more in the future i hope that my ill speaking and bad explanations you still learned something today and I hope I sparked your curiosity in the physics just a little bit. Even you, Nick. Or at least made your head hurt a little bit by realizing how complex the universe is. I assume, again, I made many mistakes. But I do try. Bold of you, Mike, to assume I'm still not worried about a mountain lion with a lightsaber. And instead I'm thinking about physics. But yeah, sure. <laughs> physics makes the world go round, baby. But boy, I can't wait to see what the new states of matter we discover in the future. And they're just going to get weirder and weirder. Thank you all for listening. Thanks for listening to the Backyard Philosophy Podcast. We rarely finish a podcast without missing a point we wanted to bring up, so let us know what we forgot. And if you have a topic you want us to talk about, let us know at Backyard Philosophy on Instagram and Backyard Philosophy Podcast on Facebook.